Realm presents Outliers, a Realm original. Episode 6. At the conclusion of his monologue, his testament, I said nothing. I just left. Walked out. The last image I had of him was of him sitting in his recliner wrapped in his Navajo blanket, chin thrust out in defiance, thin lips pinched together, his blue eyes as cold as an arctic squall. Boy, he called after me, his voice almost gone. Boy, get your ass back in here. I kept going. I almost expected to feel the punch of a bullet in my back, but nothing happened. Across the compound, out of the gate, which I took care to lock behind me, I needed to get back to girl. I naively wanted to believe that if he could just meet her, talk to her, that all would be well. That if only Doc could see she wasn't a monster. That all that he'd created wasn't foul and corrupt. That the three of us could peacefully reside together within the walls of the compound. Provided he never repeated the outlier's origin story. Not ever again. Especially not to girl. What was done was done. What was gone was gone. There was no going back. Here and now was all we had. There were only the three of us left in the world. Absurd hope? Denial? I don't know. I just knew I couldn't leave him. No matter what he'd done. He was my father. My da. Not my blood, but my family. He'd cared for me since before I could walk. He'd raised me as his own. He'd rescued me from certain death. Whoever he'd been, whatever he'd done had mostly occurred before I was even born. Besides, he was too frail to survive on his own now. Maybe that's what all enablers or accomplices after the fact tell themselves before they look the other way. I don't know. I knew only one thing with absolute certainty. I wouldn't lose, girl. No matter what I had to do. I'd traveled on foot for hours, when doubt crept in like a cold-blooded snake weaving its way into a woodpile. I started to fear that she would be gone, that she wouldn't have waited, that she would have fled, that she didn't care for me as I did for her. But when I burst over the hillock and plunged down towards the hot springs, sliding like an unfettered marionette in the scree, she was sitting on a rock near the carefully raked ashes of our campfire. She loaded the pack, strapped it up. She was ready to go, to go home with me, and to meet Da. Girl was all alone in the world and she trusted me trusted me to keep her safe. I realized in that moment that I loved her. I prayed to God for the first time in my life. I prayed that the things I heard from Da's lips had been a fever dream from which I'd just woken up. That the man I'd known my entire life, who cared for me like a son, who taught me everything I know, was not the author of the solution. He couldn't be. Girl didn't ask me what I'd said to Da or he to me. She didn't ask me anything about Da at all because she wanted to be surprised. Surprise to girl was akin to delight. As we followed my trail in the snow, I caught her skipping across the ground a couple of times, skipping like a child, humming a tune under her breath, smiling as wide as one of those yellow smiley face buttons I'd seen mounted on displays in abandoned gas station convenience stores. When she found a smooth stone, she would exclaim with a kind of joy I figured must be childlike. She set the rock in her slingshot and sent it whizzing into the sky like a meteor. Good one, I'd say and we'd both laugh. When I first saw her in the woods, I figured we were close in age. Now I reckon she must be younger than I was. Not by much. She had the body of a young woman in the way I had the body of a young man. Not man and woman yet, but almost. Whenever we could, we walked side by side, holding hands. I carried both packs on my back. Despite her small physique, she was strong. Wiry strong. She could have carried one of the packs, but the weight kept me focused focused on what was yet to come. I intended to have her walk behind me, so that Da would have to shoot me to get a shot at her. I should have taken one of the guns with me, but I hadn't thought ahead. That wasn't like me, under normal circumstances. But these weren't normal circumstances. I had my bow and quiver of arrows if I needed to defend myself. To defend her. I tugged off my gloves and stuffed them in the pocket of my coat, just in case, so my bowstring fingers would be free. But I prayed again, that it wouldn't come to that. A cacophony of barking greeted us as we emerged from the trees. As we approached the gate, 
The dogs came trotting towards us, tails wagging tentatively. A few were low growling. They recognized me, but the presence of girl distressed them. To them, the outliers were intruders. Threat. Easy, dogs. Easy. She's a friend. They didn't know the word. I'd never used it before. I never had a reason to. She pulled off her gloves and crouched down near the fence, pressing her face against the wire, making soothing muttering sounds while holding her palms out. The dogs came closer. She showed no fear. Gray, the biggest one, the alpha dog, approached. He sniffed her fingers cautiously, eyes glittering, but she had her own gaze averted, letting him know she meant no harm. He whined, that high-pitched puppy whine of affection I knew well, and he licked her fingers. The others reacted accordingly, whining, wiggling, tails wagging wildly. I opened the gate and they surrounded us. She crouched down, laughing, hugging each in turn as they licked her face. She was no outlier. Now I was grinning like a yellow smiley face button. I took her hand to help her to her feet. The warmth of her fingers almost took my breath away. Hand in hand, amidst the swirling pack of dogs, we made our way toward the cabin. Smoke, I was glad to see, was rising from the chimney. Dom must have been watching from the windows, alerted by the barking of the dogs. He stepped out onto the plank porch and stood at the top of the porch stairs, a shotgun in his hands, squinting, mouth shaped in an O of surprise, or horror. I stopped in my tracks and pushed girl behind me. Da, it's me. He didn't move, but he did raise the barrel of the shotgun. His bony fingers curled around the trigger. Da! I wailed. Please! I didn't intend it, but I heard the echo of the fearful child in my voice. Of the little boy that had cried out for his da whenever he was hurt or afraid. He must have heard it too because he abruptly went back inside, the screen door slamming behind him with a loud bang. I breathed a ragged sigh of relief. It's okay now, I said to the girl with more confidence than I felt. He knows it's me. I smiled and took her hand in mine. My projected certainty calmed her. But in my heart, I wasn't certain at all. I was terrified of what he might do. To her. Then... A shotgun blast as loud as an explosion. Instinctively, like woodland animals, we both crouched, ready to flee if need be. Even the dogs, who were used to gunfire, balked and scattered. Neither of us had been hit. Da? I whispered in charge for the cabin. He was sitting in the recliner near the hearth, the Navajo blanket across his knees. He'd slipped off his boot and hooked a toe through the trigger. I stared for a long time at the hole in his dirty gray sock where his big toe, the nail horny and yellow, poked through. I didn't realize he hadn't been darning his socks, or washing his clothes, or bathing himself as he once did. He should have asked me to assist him. I would have helped. It wasn't until Girl pulled open the screen door behind me that I looked up at his face, or where his face used to be. He'd stuck the muzzle of the shotgun against the roof of his mouth before he pulled the trigger. The blast had nearly vaporized the top of his head. A Jackson Pollock spray of blood and brains went up the wall to the ceiling. Bits of brain spatter sizzled in the hearth, like frying meat. All that was left was his lower jawbone and a few bloody teeth. Her gasp was sharp and filled with very human anguish. There were tears pooling in her dark eyes. Why? Why did he do that? She asked because he saw me hand in hand with a mutant, a genetically engineered humanoid meant to be expendable, a hybrid creature he'd been responsible for creating, that he'd rather be dead than see his adopted son befriend an outlier. But that's not what I told her. Da was old, and he was sick, dying. Cancer, maybe. He'd been hale and hearty all his life, strong and vital like a true mountain man. He wasn't one to accept dying slowly and painfully, wasting away, that wasn't who he was. Maybe he didn't want to be a burden to us. She nodded, tears spilling down her cheeks. She understood. Every word I said was true. I didn't lie to her, but I didn't tell her the whole truth. Nor would I. I didn't touch him, but I let the dogs see that he was dead. Dogs need to see, to smell, in order to understand what has happened. Gray lay on his belly and howled like a grieving wolf. The others whimpered and cowered. The girl helped me carry my belongings and a collection of essential household goods over to one of the Quonset huts. I left most of his old clothing but removed the guns. Da and I had built that cabin by hand, but I wouldn't sleep inside it ever again.
girl and I could build another cabin of our own, maybe closer to the creek so we could hear the sound of water gurgling past in the summertime. We cleared the ground 20 feet in diameter around the cabin before we torched it. Me, girl, and the dogs watched it burn, the flames rising 50 feet in the air at the pinnacle of the fire. And we watched until the cabin disintegrated to ash, a fitting funeral pyre, like a viking in his longboat, incinerating into eternity. What remained, by the morning light, were a few support beams that rose into the sky like charred whalebone ribs. This chapter of my life is over, I thought. Girl and I didn't speak the entire time the fire burned, but she kept her small fingers pressed gently, reassuringly, against the nape of my neck. We caught a glimpse of the rising sun at the horizon at the moment it rose into the cloud banks and became a faded radiant orb. I didn't look at her when I spoke. I stared at the areola of the hidden sun. When spring comes around, I think we should go, I said. Travel south. See what, or who, is out there. I don't think we should stay on here. She agreed. She had been traveling southward when I met her with the same idea in mind. This wasn't her home she'd be leaving. Just another way station on a long journey. We spent the rest of the winter in the compound. We slept in the bunkhouse with the dogs, sharing an upper cot, zipped together in a pair of sleeping bags, wrapped in each other's arms. We cooked together did chores together and read books from the Quonset Hut library long into the evenings. We found a manual on American Sign Language and practiced signing so that we could speak silently to each other from across the compound. I love you, I signed. I love you too, answered her nimble fingers. We talked aloud for hours at a time, sharing experiences in our lives. We laughed a lot. I did anyway. She giggled like a girl, which she was. We took care to rake over the ashes where the cabin had been, creating a little hillock that we filled with dark, fertile soil. We seeded the ground. Long after we'd gone, grass would grow there. Wildflowers would, too. A fitting burial mound. When spring came, we packed up what we could carry. I let all the domestic animals loose into the meadow. The chickens, goats, sheep, pigs, and a small herd of cows, though I didn't know if they could survive on their own but I couldn't barricade them in the compound to starve. The dogs would be fine, I was certain. They were a pack. Their hunting skills were on par with those of wolves. Out of habit, I bolted all the concept huts in the bunkhouse and locked the perimeter gates behind us as we left. If the weather turned without warning, we might need a place to come back to. At least we would have grains, dried meats, and canned fruits to last a year or more, along with all the books we could possibly read. The dogs followed us, You can't tell a dog not to follow you if it's bound and determined. Their place is with humans, after all. I won't lie. The journey was grueling. I'd only ever traveled any great distance to the north of our compound, and the only landmarks and trails I was intimately familiar with were in that direction. Da and I had explored each and every road, each paved tributary stretching north, northeast, and northwest from the highway. At least ten often 20 miles inland. All the abandoned human settlements. Every village, every hamlet, every ski resort, every roadside store and business, every homestead. He claimed the outliers, seeking warmth, migrated south. That's why we never roamed in a southerly direction. I'd never questioned what he told me. The landscape to the south turned out to be much more rugged than I'd imagined. Deep forests, swollen white water rivers too raging to wade or swim across. We wasted several full days traveling downstream in an easterly direction in order to find a narrow place to cross to the other side of a particularly wide river. The dogs followed us at a distance, even after I yelled at them to go back. I didn't know what dangers we would face on our journey south. I didn't want them in peril. Girl and I could take care of ourselves. We encountered no outliers along the way. I'm glad of that. Mid-morning on the twelfth day of our journey south, everything changed. We'd been walking along an old dirt access road, probably blazed by the Forest Service a couple of decades ago, enjoying the rare warmth of the cloudless day when Girl stopped short. What is that? She asked. She pointed at something in a tree. A security camera mounted on a branch. I'd seen lots of pole-mounted security cameras at ski resorts. Da had told me they were connected to monitors in the security office, 
so the guard could sit behind a desk in his office and watch what was going on all over the grounds while sipping coffee and eating a sandwich. Recorded all, too. I'd taken a few cameras down to examine them. They were as dead as the rest of the electronics. But this one wasn't. Near its lens, a light glowed red. I stepped sideways. The lens swiveled to follow my movement, like the barrel of a rifle aligning prey in its sight. Before I could shout the girl to turn and run, a dozen armed soldiers appeared out of nowhere. Their automatic weapons trained on us, green laser beam dots freckling our chests. We froze. They were decked out head to toe in forest camo, with black bulletproof vests, helmets with tinted visors, and lace-up combat boots. Besides their automatic rifles, they had handguns strapped to their upper thighs, not a sliver of bare skin showing. I couldn't be sure that they were human or not. The dogs, who had been following us a dozen yards back, barked a few times, then fled into the woods. Get down on your knees. Get down on your knees now. Humans, then. Like me. I didn't know which soldier was shouting at us. The voice was distorted through some sort of megaphone. I couldn't see any of their faces through their visors. I stepped in front of girl as I slowly got down on my knees. She crouched down behind me. Don't shoot, I said calmly as I could. Please, she's with me. Don't shoot us. Place your fingers on the top of your head. Do it. Please. Shut up and comply. We will fire upon you both. We complied. They surrounded us in seconds. Four of them roughly lifted me off my feet and dropped me flat on the ground onto my belly, pinning all four of my limbs to the dirt grinding my face into a pile of fallen leaves as two others tore off my pack, confiscated my quiver of arrows, and emptied my pockets. They took my bowie knife. They took my hunting rifle and my bow. Each time I tried to speak, one of them shoved my face back down to silence me. Up close, I saw they had oxygen packs on their backs, with hard rubber retractable hoses snaking into their helmets. Modified biohazard suits, I thought. Designed specifically for military use. A small old glory flag patch decorated their shoulder sleeves. Americans, then. Like me. They zip-tied my hands behind my back and hauled me to my feet. The hard plastic dug into my wrists, cutting off the blood flow so my fingers went numb in seconds. Then they zip-tied my ankles together. Before I could protest, one soldier slipped a heavy clear plastic bag over my head and tightened it around my neck. The bag stuck to my wide-open mouth. I couldn't breathe. I thought they intended to euthanize me right there on the access road. Then I heard a swishing sound, and the bag inflated with cool air. Breathable oxygen. I could feel the hose pressing and squirming down my back. Some kind of field oxygen tank system. I didn't need oxygen. The ambient air was breathable. Maybe they didn't know that. Or maybe they knew something I didn't. I shouted, but the heavy plastic bag over my face deadened any sound I made. Two soldiers lifted me half off my newly shackled feet and started dragging me up the road. I twisted and craned my neck in time to see Girl, pinned to the ground but squirming madly, her eyes trying to find mine, as one soldier injected her in the shoulder with a syringe gun. She arched her back, then stopped moving. They slipped an oxygen mask over her face and lifted her into a heavy canvas bag, which they zipped up. On the side was stenciled, Live Specimen. Warning. Biohazard. At least it said live. You're listening to Outliers, narrated by Rory Culkin. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Outliers is executive produced by Dave Beasley and narrated by Rory Culkin. Created by Cassandra Wells and Dave Beasley based on the novella Outliers by Cassandra Wells. Produced for Realm by Alexis Latshaw and Haley Wagreich. Additional sound design and editing by Rory O'Shea. Cover art by Kendall Thomas and Michał Krasnopolski. <laughs>